All right, man. Good morning, church. Good morning. It is a good day to be in God's house. It's a good day to be with y'all here today. And uh, man, I'm excited. I'm excited for what's going on. I'm excited for what we've got. A lot of cool stuff planned for today, uh, but, but it's Sunday, right? It's a special Sunday. We get to celebrate the risen Lord Jesus, but each and every Sunday we come together to celebrate the same thing, the resurrection of Christ. Uh, in a second, I'll share with you a few scriptures uh, about that first day of the week, about what it is. But before we do, I've got a couple things to share with you about our church. Uh, we had an awesome service on Good Friday. It was awesome a couple days ago, a couple evenings ago. We had a worship service. We got to record, so I'll be looking for that in a, in a, in a little bit. It's going to take some time to edit and get everything down and re-record it, but uh, it's going to be cool. It's going to be exciting, something we've never done before. We recorded our worship service, and uh, we get to put that out there in the future uh, to kind of go and, and share the gospel through that, through that manner in there and encourage some people in that. So Friday was awesome. Uh, so this morning is going to be awesome. It's Easter morning. Uh, everybody's looking sharp. If you want to take your pictures right after service, we can. I know Brother Cullen's been busy back there with the camera. Everybody's looking sharp, aren't they? Yeah. It's looking good. It's looking good. And so after service, if you didn't have a chance before church to get your pictures taken, you can head on right through the Legacy Hall doors. It's in the second room. And you can uh, t get your pictures taken with your family. Uh, pretty cool, pretty cool, that kind of stuff. Tonight, we're going to be back at 5 p.m. for our communion service. We're going to be able to celebrate the Lord's Supper together on this Easter evening. So tonight, 5 p.m., communion. And then next Sunday, I want you to be back. It's going to be April 24th. Our B kids are going to be leading us some more. Uh, the choir is going to be leading us today. Uh, I'm very excited for that. Uh, they've been working hard on it, and they sound good, and it's going to be awesome. Uh, little Elijah, where's he at? How's your heart doing? Is it pumping? <laughs> it's pumping, man, but it's going to be cool. Uh, the B-Kids Choir is awesome, but next Sunday as well, our B-Kids are going to be leading us in more worship and some memory verses uh, and some Bible trivia and stuff like that. It's going to be really cool. So be back next Sunday. We're looking forward to it, and we're also, it's, it's always cool to see the kids lead, right? It's always cool to see them lead us in worship, and it's always cool to see them be able to engage us in that way. So that's what's coming up. Uh, Mother's Day is coming up as well next month. That's our... Uh, Something else we're looking forward to. And we're going to take family pictures on that day as well. Um, so you can register for that on your church center app. I think that's all the events I've got for you this morning. This time I'm going to ask you to stand to your feet. We're going to read some scripture together. I'd mentioned that the church meets on the first day of the week to celebrate the resurrection of Christ. If you look at the synoptic gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, they all tell us kind of a similar story. So in Matthew 28, the first verse says, In the end of the Sabbath, as it began to dawn toward the first day of the week, then came Mary Magdalene and the other Mary. That was in Matthew. Over in Mark 16, verse 2, and very early in the morning, the first day of the week, they came into the sepulcher. You look again at Luke chapter 24, verse 1. Now upon the first day of the week, very early in the morning, there's a theme there. They went to see the tomb of Jesus on the very first day of the week. So we worship together on Sunday mornings. That's why we worship the first day of the week, because our Lord rose on the first day of the week. That's what makes the day special. Easter morning, we get to celebrate the resurrection of Jesus. On Friday, we got to celebrate the crucifixion, and we'll mention all of that again today. But the, the point of our faith is that Christ didn't stay in the grave. He didn't stay dead. On that third day, he rose again. And Paul is encouraging the church in 1 Corinthians 15. He basically flips the converse on him. He says, listen, if Christ didn't rise from the grave, we're, we're the most miserable of people. Listen, if in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men most miserable. What he's saying is, is if the resurrection didn't happen, we're to be pitied amongst all people, right? Because we show up every Sunday to worship the risen Christ. And if you flip that around, because Christ has risen from the grave, we're of all men most joyful, most happy, most blessed. Verse 20 says, but now is Christ risen from the dead. Amen. But now is Christ risen from the dead and he's become the first fruits of them that slept. The promise to us is as Christ rose from the dead, one day we, the loved ones who have gone before us that believe in Christ, they will, and we will rise with him and we'll be given bodies like him. So if you're thankful for that truth this morning, let's give the Lord a hand clap of praise. We're going to open in prayer. Man, it's good to see y'all. Brother Dylan's going to come up. He's going to lead us in prayer. And as we pray, I want you to pray for each other around this room. We've got a lot of different people represented here. We got to go around Friday evening and see the different nationalities. And I, in my life group on Wednesday, 
I had a testimony from Germany. Somebody got saved. They came from Germany over here. I had a testimony from somebody from Jamaica that was saved and came over here. I believe we got some uh, friends from Ukraine with us this morning. Yep, so y'all give the Lord a hand clap of praise for that. A lot of different people, man. It's good to see God moving in the nation. So let's pray for each other. Let's pray for God to move in us. And Brother Dylan's going to lead us in prayer. So go ahead, brother. Heavenly Father, God, we thank you for allowing us to gather here this morning, Lord, in your name. God, we just want to thank you for giving us your son, God, to stand in our place, God, to take that debt for us, Lord, to hang on the cross for our sins, God. Lord, we also thank you for the resurrecting power, Lord, that brought Jesus from the grave, God, and that that power lives in us, Lord. We thank you so much, Lord, and pray that you bless the worship team this morning and bless the pastor this morning, God, so that they touch many more hearts and souls this morning, God. We love you and thank you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. our hope in life and death Christ alone Christ alone what is our only confidence that our souls to him belong who holds our days within his hands what comes apart from his command and what will keep us to the end, the love of Christ in which we stay. Oh, sing hallelujah, our hope springs eternal. Oh, sing hallelujah, now and ever we confess Christ our hope in life and day. What truth can calm the troubled soul? God is good, God is good. Where is His grace and goodness and all? In our great Redeemer's blood, who holds our faith when fears arise, who stands above the stormy trials, who sends the waves that bring us nigh unto the shore, the rock of Christ. Oh, sing hallelujah, our hope springs eternal. Oh, sing hallelujah, now and ever we confess Christ our hope in life and day. Unto the grave, what will we sing? Christ, he lives, Christ, he lives. And what reward will heaven bring? Everlasting life with him. And we will rise to meet the Lord. Then sin and death will be destroyed. And we will feast an endless joy when Christ is ours forevermore. Oh, sing hallelujah, our hope springs eternal. Oh, sing hallelujah, now and ever we confess Christ our hope in life and death. our hope and life and day. 
Amen and amen. You can have a seat right where you are this morning. We thank y'all for worshiping with us today. We thank y'all for being here on this Easter morning. This time our B-Kids Choir is going to get ready to come up and lead us in song. So if you're in the B-Kids Choir, y'all come on up. Get ready. Get in your spots. Make sure we use the stairs. And man, uh, every Wednesday we get to see them lead us in worship. They get to come up here and, and sing songs and be able to, to guide us in that. And today they're going to do this in front of us on Sunday morning. If you got your Bible, we're going to go um, over to Luke chapter 24. And I want to look at the words that Jesus spoke after his resurrection. And he said unto them, these are the words which I spake unto you while I was yet with you. This is Jesus speaking to his disciples. That all things must be fulfilled. You see, Christ took very much care that the scriptures be fully fulfilled in him, which were written in the law of Moses. We see some, some hints of Christ there, which were written in the, well, the prophets. We see a lot of mention of Christ there. And in the Psalms, which we sing about concerning me. So Jesus is reminding his disciples, he's, he's fully completed all this. And look at verse 45, then opened he their understanding that they might understand the scriptures. That's our hope and prayer this morning, that God would open our understanding so that we can understand what's going to be preached this morning, what's going to be exhorted about. And he said unto them, that is, thus it is written, listen to how he worded this, thus it's written, thus it behoved Christ to suffer. Christ knew he had to suffer. Hebrews 12 says, for the joy that was set before him, he died on the cross for us, Right? But Christ knew he had to suffer, but Christ also knew he had to rise again that third day. He also knew that he was going to come back to bring death, hell, the grave in chains, to break the bondage of death for us and for all men. And that the repentance and the remission of sins should be preached. So because Christ is risen, because we have that eternal hope we sing about, thus Christ should be preached among the nations. His name should be preached. And he said beginning at Jerusalem, that was where they were. For us, we could say beginning in Barbel, where we are, and you are witnesses of these things. So this morning, we're going to sing about Christ breaking the holds of chains for us, breaking, breaking asunder death, hell, and the grave. But if you believe in the name of Jesus, the same can be true for you. Same is true for me because of the faith God has given me. And so we're going to worship together. These, uh, the kids are going to lead us in worship. And I say kids, this is our youth choir, really. They're young adults. And it takes a lot to stand up here. It takes a lot to stand up here. And so let's worship with them. Let's sing with them. And let's honor God together. Come back. Oh, shame is a prisoner as cruel as a grave. Shame is a robber and he's come to take my name. There ain't no grave 
death and life in their own tree. The Lamb of God was crucified, and he went on down the hill, and he took back every key. He rose up as a lion, and he set all captives free. He is alive. is the lamb, right? Yeah. Worthy is the lamb who's to be praised. Hallelujah. Christ has come one time and he's coming again. He sealed that for us in his death and his resurrection. B kids, man, an awesome job, youth choir. We thank y'all so much. Y'all can be dismissed right through here. Thank y'all for leading us in worship. Let's give my hand again. Come on. Be good. Either way. Man. Awesome, awesome. They all, they look nice. They dress nice. It's cool to see that. It's cool to, it's cool to watch them grow up too, man. It's cool to see the, the maturing that's happening, what's going on in their lives, how they're growing. Uh, it's steady growth too. It's steady. It's there, uh, not only in their, their talent, their ability. Um, Elijah, man, uh, how long have you been beating on the drums? How long? One or two years, okay. Rylan, how long have you been playing the guitar? Three or four years. I mean, look, y'all, that's awesome. That's awesome to happen. It's cool to, to see God moving in their lives, uh, and, and that's the future of our church. That's the future of what we're doing. That's, that's the ministry. That's what it's about. Um, at this time, we're going to uh, do our sign team, and we're going to sing, and we're going to continue to worship. We're not, we're not disengaging from worship to watch us, okay? That's, that's, not, that's not our goal. We said Friday night when we were here, we wanted to bring that same spirit, that same enthusiasm in worship. And this is a good song to do it to. This is a good song to, to thank Jesus for the blood that he shed for us. Before we do that, I do want to welcome anybody who's here for the very first time. Uh, this, this is us. 
And this is us. We're here. Uh, these are the kids that have led us. These are our sign team, and uh, this, this is what you get, right? Uh, we're Bethany. We're a place that does love God, love others, and serve both. Uh, but if you are here for the first time, we want to pray for you because as our mission to, to serve both is in prayer. And so if you can text this word welcome to 803-621-0366, that allows us to pray for you as a church. The leadership, we meet in the back every Sunday morning to go over some prayer requests. And if you'd like something the church can pray for as a whole, let me know and we can put it on the the church prayer list, and be able to pray for you there. But we want to say thank you for being here. Let's welcome our first-time guest here this morning to church. And man, if you want to know more about the church, if you want to get involved in stuff, we've got a step and Forward class on Wednesday nights that Brother Cullen is leading. Doing an awesome job there. Here's Brother Cullen in the, with the yellow tie. Um, he leads our step and Forward class. That's where you get to learn more about the church, kind of what we do, what we believe. So talk to him, ask him about it, and uh, let's continue in worship. Let's go to God in prayer, and uh, let's continue what we do. So Lord, we thank you for uh, the blood of Jesus. I thank you for the blood that was shed on the cross for the remission of sins, Lord. For us to be able to stand here and worship, for us to be able to stand here and sing redeemed. Lord, you shed not just a little bit, but you shed it all for us. So much that when they pierced your side, the, the, the rest of the water and everything came out. Lord, you gave it all on the cross for us. And this morning, we want to say thank you for that. But Lord, not just in thanksgiving do we worship. We worship in faith, worship in the grace that you've given us. And I ask now that as we continue this service, Lord, that you will continue to reveal more of who you are to us so that our worship can go further. In Jesus' name, and all God's people said amen, amen. and amen. was a wretch. I remember who I was. I was lost. I was blind. I was running out of time. Sin separated. The breach was far too wide. But from the far side of the chasm, you held me in your sight. So you made a way across the great divide Left behind heaven's throne To build it here inside And there at the cross You paid the debt I owe Broke my chains, freed my soul For the first time I had hope Thank you, Jesus, for the blood of life. Thank you, Jesus, it has washed me white. Thank you, Jesus, you have saved my life. Brought me from the darkness into glorious light You took my place laid inside my tomb of sin You were buried for three days but then you walked right out again and now death has no sting and life has no end for I have been transformed by the blood of the Lamb. Thank you, Jesus, for the blood of light. Thank you, Jesus, who has washed me white. Thank you, Jesus, you have saved me. Dog. 
we thank you this morning for the blood that was shed for us but that was applied for us Lord, we were dead in our sins we were dead in our trespasses and yet while we were sinners Christ you died for us for the ungodly and Lord you not only left us in darkness you not only left us in sin left us under the curse but Lord you came and broke those chains for us now we can sing glory to your name, not as a rebellious, but Lord, as a son, as a daughter, we can sing glory to your name. And Lord, we can wait expectantly for the day where you come to bring us home, where you come to bring us into your kingdom. And Lord, we pray and ask that you'll continue to deliver us here on earth. You'll continue to give us peace here on earth. And God, let us give you all the honor and the glory in Jesus' name. And all God's people said amen. And amen. Amen. If you're glad to be in God's house, give the Lord a big old round of applause. At this point, I feel like the cricket uh, that starts chirping right after a hurricane. What a blessing. Uh, we've been blessed fully in song this morning, and uh, it's encouraging for me just as a pastor to, to watch people glorify God with their talents and their gifts, and here it is, their desire. We didn't wring one person's arm to make them get up here. I would have never sat at a drum set or stood over a piano or sung a lead in fourth, fifth, sixth grade and did what these children did. Uh, but I certainly appreciate their effort, and that's what they put in. Every Wednesday night, they want to be a part of this. And I was telling Ryan, sitting over there next to him, Ryan's a deacon here at the church, and He's been playing our drums for years and years and years here. He's been doing a great job. And the only drummer Elijah's ever seen is Ryan. And probably the only reason that Elijah wants to do drums is because he's seen Ryan do drums. Isaiah wanted to play the piano because he saw it done by Todd. And he has a high respect for Todd. And he wanted to do it. And so he's been doing it for years here with us now. And he's only in the seventh grade. What I'm saying is what you do matters in a great and glorious way. And soon, you kids that were up here leading, the next group's going to be looking at you. And they're going to want to do what you're doing because you're doing it. It's called example. It's called influence. It's called real influence. And you have more influence and you have more joy and more glory in singing and using your gifts at the church than you ever will have in the world. So we won't, as a church, allow the world just to snatch up our young singers and musicians and use them after we've put so much work into them for the glory of God. We will guard them with our hearts and allow them to continue uh, to be used for God's glory. I want you to take your Bible and go with me to the book of Mark chapter 16. Mark chapter 16. Well, as you're turning there together, years ago I wrote a little blog that went nowhere and many, most people never seen it or, or read it. It was simply called The Nations of Barnwell. And even then, it was in my heart and my desire to see people from different nationalities, different countries, end up at a church service and in the future become members. The people that are in our community are not all alike. They're diverse. 
They're from different backgrounds. And today is a little sneak peek at that desire coming to fruition. Just a little sneak peek. And I want to let you know something, my, my friends from Ukraine, I got to speak to you. I know we met years ago, but I've been praying for your family. I've been praying for your country and uh, what the folks over there are going through. And we're going to continue to pray as a church for your family and for your country. We have people represented from America, of course, and we went through and asked everybody the other week different states they were from, and there's a lot of different states represented here. And as I was talking to one brother that's from out west, he said, coming from out west to the southeast is like coming to another country in some aspects. It's different. We have folks represented from different states out of our own country. We have folks represented from India. We have folks represented uh, from Germany. And folks represented from Jamaica, and that is in a little town like Barnwell of 4,000 people. Now, why is that so? Because the gospel works. Amen. And the gospel has a gravity to it that pulls us not only to Christ, but when you come to Christ, you come to an innumerable multitude of other believers. So when you come to Christ, you're actually walking into a community of diverse believers who love Jesus like you do. Jesus will and is bringing all nations together through the preaching of the greatest story, the greatest truth ever heard on this planet. And that's the gospel of Jesus Christ. If you believe the gospel, give the Lord a hand clap of praise where you are. I titled this little message very simply this. He died and lives. That's an upside down statement. Very upside down. Even in the book of Genesis, that great historical account of God beginning to bring a people out to be his own people. The book of Genesis has a lot in it, but it has this statement that's reoccurring. He lived and then he died. Speaking of people, they live and they die. They live and they die. They live and they die. And over and over and over, that is a truth in our own lives. We see people live and they die. We see people live and they die. But Jesus turned all that upside down. And he made all of that right because he died and he lives, which has eternal implications that such a truth, I mean, if you're going to be a radical teacher, if you're going to be a radical truth teller, be Jesus. Because he laid out truth that is hard to grasp or even conceive, but it makes plenty of sense. Historically, it aligns correctly. Historically, it's in line with every witness that spoke of it. And now we here, 2,000 years later, proclaims he died Yet he lives. The powerful pondering of the risen Lord. Let's take our Bibles and read Mark 16, 1 through 7 together. A copy of God's word is provided for you on the screen above. And when the Sabbath was passed, Mary Magdalene and Mary the mother of James and Salome had bought, had bought sweet spices and that, that they might come and anoint him after he had died and been crucified. And it was very early in the morning, the first day of the week, they came into the sepulcher at the rising of the sun. And they said among themselves, who shall roll away the stone from the door of the sepulcher? Who's going to unbond this seal? Because it was sealed. Who's going to loose it? Who is going to roll back the great stone, which would have been set in such a way it had been set in such a way where it had been locked going in a downhill trajectory. So it would be hard to roll uphill. And then it would be cemented and fastened to secure the sepulcher. And so it was a great question. They went with a good heart and a good desire to anoint the body of the one they loved. And as they're walking, they're questioning what we would be asking too. Who's going to unvault this coffin? That we may be able to perform these rites and these rituals. And when they looked, they saw the stone was already rolled away, for it was very great. And they entered into this, 
graveyard. They entered into this sepulcher. They entered into this massive coffin, if you will. And they saw a young man sitting on the right side, clothed with a long white garment. And they were frightened. Well, I, I would be too. If you go to a graveyard and this dug up and a body's missing, and there's a stranger sitting there real calm and chill, you call in the police. As you drive it away in a frantic. He saith unto them, Be not affrighted. You seek Jesus of Nazareth, which was crucified. He is risen. He was dead, but now he lives. Now, I want to make this very plain. I have, I have one aim this morning, and that is to rehearse and rejoice with believers that Jesus is alive. And that he does live. And our hope and our desire and our purpose is with him. That our eternity is solidified. That our hopes to live beyond the grave and be resurrected is real. I'm here to remember and rejoice in that truth and be fed with that truth. And be fired up with that truth. But if you're here and you don't believe such, my goal and my aim is to convince you of such a truth. What a task. A task that's not going to be done without the aiding and power of the Holy Spirit opening your understanding to the Scripture. He is risen. Y'all say that with me. He is risen. He's not here. Behold the place where they laid him. Look at the rest of the instruction. Go your way and tell this story. Go your way and tell the rest of the disciples this story. Go tell them what you've seen. Go give them this new history lesson. Go find the disciples. Find Peter. Go into Galilee, there you shall see him as he said unto you. So not simply here's an empty grave with nobody in it, and he's risen, but go tell what you've seen to others, especially those who have been following him faithfully, those who have been following him faithfully and have fallen on hard times. Go tell them what you've seen, and you will see him there. It's not done. It's not over. It's not just an empty grave. There's a whole lot more to the story. There's Jesus, the infinite, eternal Son of God who died and lives. Now, Father, there is no way for us to rejoice save in you. There's no way for a man or a woman or a child to hear this message and understand it with clarity outside of you. So God, we are a people that stand in need of you. We are a people that stand in need of your presence, that stand in need of your healing, that stand in need of your revelation, that stand in need of your peaceful ability and your ability to bring peace to our lives. We are a people that stand in need of forgiveness of sins, we are a people that stand in need of reconciliation. We're a people that stand in need of revival. We're a people that stand in need of your knowledge, of your purpose. We're a people that stand in need of you, O oh God. And this morning I pray that our needs are met through the preaching of your word and through the moving of your spirit on our will and our consciousness. Let us not miss one word of what you are telling us. Let us not fall asleep mentally. Let us not lay our heads back and ignore the great truths of the gospel. Let us not miss eternity for temporal pleasure. May your name be exalted amongst your people in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, Amen and Amen. The greatest story, the greatest historical truth spread first and foremost by word of mouth. And for around 20 years, 20 to 30 years, the church grew and blossomed through the preaching and the teaching of word of mouth. 
Now, according to the book of Luke, some people had sat, sat down and maybe had written each other a letter or two and explained some of the gospel and given some of the narrative, some of the historical account. But when Luke sat down, he said, others have sat down to write forth this treatise, but I have a full understanding and I thought it necessary to write out the life of Jesus to Theophilus. And so he did. But the earliest writings, the earliest Christians' writings that surfaced about the resurrection from the dead and that great truth of Jesus being uh, dying for our sins, being buried and rising again according to the Scriptures, were pinned down by the Apostle Paul. That's the earliest writings that you'll find about Jesus' resurrection was one who persecuted this early church that was spreading the good news of Jesus by the word of mouth. So the word of mouth is very powerful. And so when we think about Jesus' story being told, his life and his death and his burial and his resurrection and why it all happened, when we think about it being spread by word of mouth, some people say, well, man, it was 20 or 30 years removed from the resurrection before somebody wrote it down. I mean, is word of mouth trustworthy? Historical word of mouth may be the most trustworthy data collection we have, period. There's a group of, uh, of Australians or a tribal group of Australians that grew up through Australian ranks. And they kept such an oral historical tradition about fishing and weather They kept such a strict oral tradition about the happenings of not only what happened weather-wise and what happened naturally, but what happened historically in their travelings and what happened, that scientists and geologists have been able to reshape what Australia would look like and some of the islands lost based on oral tradition. 300 generations of preserved oral tradition and historical truth. 300 generations was able to be kept just through passing down of word of mouth. And you say, how in the world could that happen without there being some kind of a a break in the storytelling? How, How could it stay so accurate? Here's how. Because there's always three to four generations alive to check the story as it was being told. So I would be telling a story, and my grandfather, if there was an error in it, said, no, 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 that's not correct. There are checks and balances through their culture to make sure that the story was 100% accurate because they made sure of that. It wasn't done on a whim. It wasn't done haphazardly. And to this day, we have information from historical word of mouth. And it was only 20 to 30 years after Jesus had rose from the dead that we begin to find accounts written of Jesus' resurrection. I'm not going to get into the historical part of it. I want to get into the theological part of this for a little bit. According to the scripture, according to the preaching of the apostle Peter in Acts 2, 22 through 24, it was impossible that Jesus was to stay dead. You men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved of God among you by the miracles and wonders and signs which uh, which God did by him in the midst of you, as you also know. Listen up is what he's saying. Him, Jesus, being delivered by the determined counsel and foreknowledge of God, you have taken and by wicked hands you have crucified and you have slain or you have killed him whom God hath raised up having loosed the pains of death because it was not possible that he should be holden or kept captive by death. Jesus died which implies that he lived. He was human like us and sinless, not like us. His sinlessness is expressed in his not giving in to temptation and always doing the Father's will. 
Being he was sinless, death had no rights to him, for the wages of sin is death. But because he was sinless, there was no rights for death to keep him or hold him. There was no rights. The only reason Jesus died is because he did it voluntarily. He gave up the ghost of his own design. He did not die because death could snatch life from him. He died on our behalf willingly. It was not that it was natural causes that got him. He released his spirit from himself and said, Now it's time for me to die instead of you dying. When he suffered wrath on the cross, he said, It's now time for me to suffer the wrath that's owed to you. Not that it was owed to him, but he took our place and stood in our stead. It was not possible for Jesus to stay dead. An impossibility. So today we remember, rejoice, and rest, or we trust in the man who died and lives. Over and over and over, we see people live and die. But in Jesus, we see people that die who can live. What does this risen one do? What, what does Jesus do? I mean, we're born with a purpose. We're born for a reason. We're, we're born in this world and we have something to do while we live, right? We have a reason we live and a reason why we exist. For sure. And if Jesus is alive from the dead, which he is, why is it? What is the purpose? What is the reasoning behind this? That's what we're going to look at this morning. Number one, he lives as the hope for all of humanity. He lives as the hope for all of humanity. And then my question is this, hope for what? You say that's a broad stroke statement to say he lives for the hope of all humanity. But what hope? This kind of hope. Philippians 3, 20 through 21 type hope. If you'll look there at the screen with me. For our lifestyle, our life, our conversation is in heaven. From whence also we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 21. Who shall change our vile body. Who will change our vile body body. So now I'm hoping that Jesus will alter and transform my vile, decaying, broken, sinful body that it may be fashioned and formed like unto his glorious body, according to the working whereby he is able even to subdue all things unto himself. So the first hope that we have in Jesus, so to speak, is the fact that this body that will die and that is supposed to decay will be marvelously, miraculously, and eternally changed. I think we all would like this dying yet getting to live thing. Now you may push back against that and say, no, 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 that, that won't happen for me or that's not going to happen. But, but it has happened in Jesus. We already see that in Christ. It already has happened in Him. And His promise is that we look for Him that's going to change us to be like Him. That means take your flaws. Take your genetic defects. Take your crippleness. Take, take your cancer. Take your depression. Take your chemical imbalance. Take, take your anger. Take, take, take the things that separate you from others. Take all of that and it's been crucified with Christ and now we hope in change. We hope not in some spastic change, but we have an example of transformation and resurrection in Jesus Christ. A glorious body undefiled. That's one. Or a body like is listed in 1 Corinthians 15, 54. So in this corruptible shall have put on incorruption. In this mortal shall put on immortality. Then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. What is Paul looking toward? He's looking toward the changing and the transformation and the undoing of the sin curse on our bodies. 
We're not talking about us floating around in a spiritual abyss on a cloud somewhere. We're talking about physical bodies being transformed and raised from the grave. I want to be pointed on that. The Christian faith is about that. We're not simply about doing good works. We do good works because Christ has finished his work of redemption. We're not talking about simply saying a few prayers. We're talking about our standing that fuels our prayer life is the fact we believe Jesus is alive bodily. And that we too will share in this resurrection with Christ. Because he lives, we too shall live. So a hope that we too will die but yet live. And I think everybody in the world would love to share in such an experience. But it's not merely a living that we, like we know it, but a living in the power of individuality and community fully expressed in health and peace to worship God and enjoy Him forever. He lives to bring us hope in a world that only offers dying. Jesus offers dying and living. Number two, what else does Jesus do? He lives to save and to make intercession for each one of us. He lives to save and to make intercession for each believer. Look at Hebrews 7 and 25. Wherefore, he is able to save them to the uttermost that come unto him, that come unto God by him. There's no one Jesus cannot save. There's no one Jesus cannot forgive. There's no one who's went so far that the loving, outstretched hand of God cannot hunt them down and pluck them out of damnation. There's not one person that Jesus cannot redeem to himself. All of us are on an even playing field. We all are sinners. We all have sinned. We all have broken God's law. We have all fallen short of the glory of God. And there's not one person that's fallen so far that the grace of God cannot find them where they're at and pick them up out of a horrible pit and out of a miry pit and out of a nasty pit and out of a dirty pit and wash them off. Not only wash them off, but make them new. There's not one. And it says he's able to, and here's the reason why, he ever lives to make intercession for them. The reason he can save is because he lives. If you ever get a part of such an intellectual liberal church that they say, Jesus, he rose again in some way, but not in the physical way, then you cannot be saved. You cannot be forgiven. Without a living Christ in the presence of a living God making intercession for you, there is no remission of sins. His resurrection makes it possible for you to be a Christian. Without that, you're not a Christian. Without that, you're not saved. Without that, we are most men miserable. Because we showed up today to rehearse something that's untrue. We've wasted money on suits. We've wasted time. We've wasted some aggravation trying to get the family here on time. We've just wasted in vain for nothing. But because he lives, we can worship God through the intercessory ministry of Jesus Christ. Now, I used to think of Jesus making intercession for me as like if I pray, Jesus, you know, kind of prays on my behalf. Right? But as a high priest that's already made the atonement, as a high priest that's already finished the work, he just stands, and he is the lamb that was slain, and he is the high priest, and he is the shepherd. He's all of that. Being that he's all that we need, as he is standing or seated before God, because he lives, he's the representation that we're acceptable before God. He is the exact image of why we're acceptable before God. So as long as Jesus lives, I'm accepted before God. Now check this out. As long as God accepts Jesus, I'm acceptable before God. I am secured in the arms of Jesus. Period. And you can be too if you're not. 
And if you're like many of us and you say, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm a Christian, and, but I've, I've, been a, I've been a wondering. Did you know some of our Christian songs are written about real life? Can you believe it? One of my favorites is prone to wonder. Lord, I, I feel it. Given a chance. Outside of the Lord's prayer, lead us not to temptation. Deliver us from evil. Give it a chance. We're prone to wonder. You say, man, I, I'm, I'm prone to wonder. I... But Jesus ever lives to make intercession to you. Wonder no longer. Wonder no further. Jesus lives to make you right with God. So live right with God. So he lives to make intercession for us. Finally, well, almost finally. He lives to make all things new. Now, you don't have to be a Christian to agree with this whatsoever. This is just, we live in a broken world. We live in a sin-filled world. You first knew this, whether you understood it, you first knew this when you did something wrong as a little kid and you felt shame or guilt or you hid it. You didn't want mom and dad to know. You didn't want your teacher to know. You didn't want your daycare person to know. You did something that was unacceptable. You knew it. I don't even know if anybody told you not to do it. You just knew it. You knew it right there. You were were already witnessing get yourself as a little child that you were broken. You knew it when you became 11, 12, 13. And around that age is when you develop this consciousness that mom and dad aren't perfect. So you, you knew the world was broken when you realized my family is not fully all put together. My family has cracks in it. You knew it then. You knew it around friends when you saw the cracks in them. You knew it as you got older and you went to college, you went to the workforce, and you saw that the cracks were bigger than you ever thought. You feel it and you felt it through a pandemic. Nations feel it through war and destruction and death for little to no reason at all. None. I don't think anyone can stand up and say, I want to disagree with you and debate with you about the brokenness of the world. I think it's all together. Everybody in here would think you were bananas. And if you don't know what banana means, it means you're crazy. Nobody would agree that things are well. All of us would agree with this, though. Everybody and everything can use a newness that's outside of this world. Look what Jesus said in Revelation 21, 25, the risen Lord, he that lives. He says, I probably gave you the wrong verse. Maybe try verse 5. I like that. She's like, one minute, please. That could be the wrong verse, too, and then I'll just paraphrase it. There's always room for the RLV version of the Bible somewhere. But it's fine. He's faithful and true. Here's what he says. I make all things new. Look at verse 5. He says, Behold, I make everything new. When we talk about Jesus returning, we talk about heaven and earth passing away and there being a new heaven and a new earth, we're talking about a newness and order. We're talking about a newness in ourself. We're talking about a newness in harmony. We're talking about a newness in understanding. We're talking about a newness that we can't even imagine. A newness that looks like this. Now, let, let's, I want you to try to shape this. And this is the kind of newness. I'm, I, only can, I only can explain this my own way, Scott, the kind of newness that I see. We have a vision and a picture of God, and we get it from Scripture, but even that picture we get from Scripture runs through a fallen mind. It runs through a fall in mind, so we don't fully get it. But this is something that came to me this week that was really just breathtaking for me. God's going to be more excited to see you than you're going to be, than you're going to, be to see him. That kind of newness. You, you didn't pay nothing to get to him, but he paid everything to get to you. He gets really excited. God's going to be more excited see you you say me then to see him impossible no you're not gonna be no more full of joy than god is 
You're not going to be more any full of happiness than God. It's impossible. You're not eternal. No. God's going to be more happy to see us than we are to be to see him. That's not saying we're not going to be happy. That just says our joy isn't going to match his. That kind of newness. Let that just sink in. Argue with yourself about that a little bit. Try to find some Bible verses that disagree with that. I will sing over you with singing, says the Lord. When one person repents and turns to Jesus, it says there's rejoicing in the presence of the angels. Where's that rejoicing coming from? We made the case last Sunday night that Jesus is the heavenly choir leader. So who's leading in the rejoicing when one person turns to Jesus? Jesus himself is leading the choir and the singing. Jesus himself is leading in the worship service there. He'll be more happy to see you than you will be to see him. Finally, it's undeserved. Our salvation, what Jesus is willing to do for anyone and everyone, it's undeserved but freely giving. It's undeserved but freely given. Look at John 1.12. For those who are Christian, this is a time to say amen. It's a time to be happy. It's a time to be reminded. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to him that believe on his name. I'm going to finish with this short illustration. Maybe it'll help you. And as we're doing that, our, bab- our, our, our candidates for baptism, y'all get ready because we're going to baptize you in just, in just a minute. We're going to be ready to go. Uh, Sam, is he out there? Don, is Sam out there? Tell him to put down whatever he's got. We don't even want to know, but to come on in here and he can help, ba- help baptize, okay? I'm going to need him to help us. At my house, I have a car. Todd came and picked me up. I think I know Friday and I know today for service. They, he came twice to come get me because I needed a ride. Because in my yard, my car, uh, it, 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 a, little, a little red light came on. Now, cars have like, you know, the green light. Some cars have the green light to let you know that your lights are on. You know what I'm saying? It's got like a little green light there. Uh, maybe yours don't, but mine does. Got a little green light to it. Let you know your lights are on. Then it's got like an orange or yellow light that's kind of like, this is important. You need to get this figured out pretty soon. But it's not like urgently, like right. Y'all know what I'm talking about, them orange lights. Y'all, y'all don't mess with those lights. You actually, you hit, the, you hit, the, uh, you hit the, the dashboard trying to get that orange light. That orange light, it malfunctions all the time. You know, that, at least that's what the mechanics tell you. Now, don't worry about an orange light. It'll keep going. Praise God. But when it's a red light, if a red light's flashing on your dash, something bad is about to happen. I've got a red light that says battery. This car I got, it don't even have one of those things that tell you how much battery's left. It just tells you your battery's dying. On the way home uh, the other day from Bluffton, uh, the car starts shutting things down. The motor's still running, but like it starts shutting down different parts of the car so it keeps battery power to get me home. But let's say for an example, my car can be fixed, right? I, I might need an alternator, maybe need a battery. I don't know, but I need something. My car can be fixed, all right? That, that can happen. But let's say, for instance, maybe I don't believe in the color red. I just don't believe in color red. So the color red pops up on the screen. I don't believe in color red, Larry, so that don't mean nothing to me. Just don't believe in it. Don't like red. Don't agree with red. Don't want nothing to do with the color red. Don't believe it. You know what's going to happen to my car? It's going to sit right there and rot. But let's go a little further and say, no, no, I agree with red. Red's bad. Red means something bad's going to happen. I better believe in red. Red says I need to do something about it. But I don't believe in the mechanics. I believe that something's wrong. I just don't believe anyone can fix it. That's where a lot of people are today around the world. They believe in their heart something is wrong, something isn't right, but they don't believe anybody can fix it. They don't believe Jesus can fix it. They don't believe any religion has anything to do with anything for them. And they just lump Jesus in the midst of that and say, nobody can fix it. There is no mechanic, but there is. There is one. There's one not even a quarter mile from my house that can put a battery in my car. And there is a God of heaven that can fix 
the red lights in your life. There is a God in heaven that can fix those things that you think cannot be fixed. And he does it freely. And that's why we say there ain't no grave going to hold our bodies down. That's why we say thank you, Jesus, for the, the blood applied. That's why, because we know he can fix it. But if you don't believe that something's wrong with you, you don't believe in a red light, have it your way. But your old vessel will sit there and rot and decay. And if you say, well, I can't agree with you on a philosophical level that there's something wrong with everybody because everybody's human. I heard people say that. It sounds real cute. It's just deadly. It's true, but it's deadly. But you believe something's wrong with you, and Jesus cannot forgive you. Or Jesus cannot make you a new person. Jesus cannot redeem you. That's, you've done set the bar, so you've denied Christ. That's a dangerous place to sit. So I ask you to do two things if you have it. Number one, agree there's some red lights, number one. And agree that Jesus can redeem and fix and make all things new. If you believe in that, give the Lord a hand clap of praise where you are. We're going to do some baptism. This is, uh, this is Tyson. Tyson's been with us for some time. He's got an interesting story. Uh, we've eating lunch a couple times together, chatted over the phone a couple times, and just getting to know each other and, and speak, and a uh, very interesting story. And I'm not going to share his story, but I want him to be able to share his story one day with you. I want him to be able to tell you his background, where he's from, how, how he grew up, and, and how God got him to this point, because it's different than my story, and it's different than your story, but we got the same results. That's why word of mouth is so important. That way people know there's room in the kingdom for them. His story ain't my story, but God saving him and saved him the same way he saved me. It's not, it's not different. I love it. These are our kids. Y'all welcome them back. They're coming here to witness baptism. We always let them get the... You say, why do you let them witness baptism? So they go home and ask mom and daddy what that's about. And hopefully mom and daddy is churched enough to say, we can tell you. Or maybe they can say, hey, my kids have been asking questions. Can you help us? And yeah, we can help you. Excited, very excited for Tyson. Thank the Lord for salvation, Tyson. Thank the Lord for discipleship. Thank the Lord for good preaching and good things out there that drew you to himself. Brother Sam, will you baptize our brother into the kingdom and the church of God? That's awesome. Our, our next baptismal candidate, she's sweet as pie. She's a little younger than Tyson. Um, but the cool thing about the gospel is the gospel works. Um, Tara spoke with her about the Lord and, and answered her questions and gave her scripture. She told me at the family, it was at the family picnic, right? And uh, she told me it was one of the sweetest times one of the most you know you you know some people you don't know if they're getting it i remember this with uh landon we sat on your your porch and talked with landon about salvation i think you were eight uh eight years old he was getting it you know i've talked to adults that's kind of like yeah i want to follow jesus that you know he was getting it. He was asking me questions, wanting to know. Want, it, was just a, it was a cool time to sit out there and talk. You, I might remember more about it than you do, but I remember sitting there thinking, man, this kid, he, he, really wants to, he really wants to get in. He really wants to know. And Peyton, I think you felt the same way ab about her. This is uh, Dylan and Cheyenne. Where is Cheyenne? Where is Cheyenne? That's Cheyenne, and that's Dylan, and this is, uh, this is, <laughs> this is their daughter, right? Okay, cool. All right, good. I, didn't, I was like, where'd she go, man? This is time to baptize her daughter. So we're so excited uh, to baptize Peyton, and we're excited about her journey in the future as a, as a young woman that loves and knows Jesus, excited about her discipleship, excited what God's going to bring and birth out of her life. I had a pastor's wife testify one time. She said, I struggled. I got saved like at 11 or 12, and, and I never had a big testimony about coming out of drugs and all this kind of stuff. She said, it dawned on me. It's not that God saved me while I was in those things. It was that God saved me from those things. 
<laughs> That's good stuff, too. I could preach on that. But we're just going to baptize her. Thank God for you, honey. Let's, uh, let's stand to our feet all together. Todd, you and your team are coming to lead us. We do have communion scheduled for this evening at 5 p.m., Easter communion. Excited to partake of that together. Excited to be a part of not only baptism as an ordinance, but the Lord's Supper. We don't take communion lightly around here. We believe in it. We don't... We don't we don't see it as quote-unquote necessary, but we see it as the next thing to it. It's a very important thing. When Jesus commands it and says, do this in remembrance of me, baptism, do this because of me. Y'all with me? Because I died, lived and died and rose again, because of me, do that. And in remembrance of me, do this. So we'll have the cup and the bread and a we'll probably be a we always say short communion service so it'll be an hour long <laughs> so we'll you know might as well lie and tell the truth at the same time it's all according to your perception of time but we'd love to celebrate the Lord's death with you and his promise to return tonight um, not he's going to return tonight but we're going to celebrate the promise of his return tonight but he might return tonight I'd be here if I was you we're going to sing this hymn together. Um, these are two folks that serve in the church, deacons in our church, Brother Al, his dear wife. Appreciate them. If you want and you need and you know you do, need someone to pray with you and help you concerning believing on the Lord Jesus, these two people have led a lot of people to the Lord. They have helped a lot of people. They're kind they're correct, they're gentle, they're caring. If you need prayer or you need to say, hey, I need to follow the Lord in baptism, I need to make a profession of faith, these are the people to turn to. These are the people to come. So as, as we sing, our prayer is that you'll move if God's moving on you and trust Him as Savior. Y'all sing, let's worship. as I am without one plea but that thy blood was shed for me and that thou bidst me come to
just as I am, I would be lost, but mercy and grace, my freedom. guest here for the first time, my wife, uh, Tara, and I would love to meet you in the foyer. If you're here uh, with us most of the time, all the time, we're going to exit through this door. You can pick your children up located uh, right here by the sound room area. And uh, if you are a member of our church, be, uh, be kind and considerate uh, of our guests and uh, give me and Miss Tara time to speak with them out in the foyer uh, together. If you want to get pictures, I think, Cullen, you got a minute? It don't matter. Right, right here in this back door, second room, uh, there, he'll take some family pictures with you, okay, and let you do that. We've got a setup back there for you if you'd like to do that as well. We love you. Thank you for attending. Uh, we hope that you'll be back tonight, and we have Bible studies on Wednesdays at 645. Lord, thank you for a good day. Thank you for these, these people. Thank you for your goodness, Lord, and the word that we heard in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen, amen. God bless you. We'll see you soon.